Bob. Watch, Steve. <laughs> We're starting now. You ready, Mr. Briscoe? I'm ready. Welcome I'm, to been, I'm been ready. What are you? What are you? <laughs> Would you quit interrupting me? Welcome to a special edition of Briscoe and Bradshaw. How special <laughs> is this, John? <laughs> we have a we have a wonderful guest and a terrific thing to promote the Kern Chronicles. Mr. Steve Kern, I can list all of his accolades. I can list all of his titles, all the things he did with the fabulous ones, all the coaching he did. All you need to know, he's one of the best guys in the history of the business, and we're proud that he's our friend. Mr. Steve Kern, welcome to the show. And Jerry, shut wow. up. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, no, that was really a great introduction. I really appreciate that. I'm humbled. That's funny. You could sit and list all the accolades. That just that word's hard for me to say, but I remember when we had an angle with the Briscoe brothers here in Florida working for championship wrestling for Florida, babyface tag teams against each other. And we went to Gainesville, Florida, the University of Florida, the McConnell Center. They had just dedicated a wrestling ring and I mean a room to the wrestling team. And Jack and Gerald had been up there and they had been schmoozing these people all week long. And, and it's a baby face tag match. And we go out to get introduced. And me and Mike are the United States tag team champions. And when the guy went to introduce them, they ran down everything from Boy Scout, Cub Scout, perfect attendance at Sunday school. They gave the they gave Briscoe's like a 20-minute introduction all the way into the NAACP or whatever they are wrestling. <laughs> and then the announcer turns to me and Mike and he goes, Steve Kern and Mike Graham, United States Tag Team, eh, ring the bell. And I'm going like, that just reminded me when you were saying all the accolades. That wouldn't take long. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that wouldn't take long. To, you had a great career. Good to see career. you guys. Uh, well, thanks. I appreciate it. I mean, I enjoyed my career. I had the best time. Could you imagine going to work every day? I mean, you know, not no. like what we did. Ours was kind of like we, we gossip in cars all the way there. We drink beer all the way home. I mean, you know, you go in there and you play around. I mean, you know, the I when people ask me now, they'll say, uh, so what do you do for a living? I go, I'm retired. And they go, you're retired? What did you do? And I go, I was a professional waiter. And they go, what? I was a professional waiter. I waited everywhere. <laughs> I've been waiting all my life. I waited at airports, sitting in airplane seats, sitting in buildings, sitting in hotels, sitting in cars with guys old enough to be my grandpa. Then it switched around. Then I was their grandpa, and I'm still in the damn car traveling somewhere. But anyway, sorry, I'm rambling on on your show now. Steve, Steve, yeah, Steve you had can, me can I say something? Hey, hey, can I say something? Uh-oh. Yeah, I hey, sure hey, you hey. Hey, uh, congratulations, uh, Mr. Kerr. Not only do you have all those accolades, but you got one more accolade that you can put on those damn crying uh, chronicles for the, uh, volume two. Been uh -oh. the first time second guest on stories with Briscoe and Bradshaw. Yeah! <laughs> yes! How yes. much better does it get than that? Yes. Oh, my God. Hey, yeah. where do I get a recording of this? I'm going to sell it. <laughs> you get it anywhere you get your damn uh, uh, podcast. I, I want to watch all your shows to make sure you didn't just say that to somebody else the last time you talked to them. Oh, you're the first time guest twice appearing. No, we've never had a two time. We, we can't get nobody to come back on. Oh, no. <laughs> That's right. Well, I know it's not JBL. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank what you. do you mean by that? Uh, I mean, Steve, you just said, I mean, we, we put you over there in Gainesville. We put you over down to Cayman Islands after you knocked me out, you broke my hand on the same damn move. move. He knocked you, you out and broke your hand? Out of the same move, John. He was more clumsy than you. How did he it knock was a, you out? How can he be more clumsy than you? I'll let Steve tell you the story. <laughs> it was a simple mistake. You know, <laughs> mistakes happen. Not every match is perfect. Even though the audience thinks they're perfect when they see me work with you, Gerald, <laughs> it was excitement. You got to, you just don't, if you didn't know me when I was young, <clears throat> I didn't. I, really, I was excited about the business. You were old when I met you. Yeah, I was, I had a passion for it. And, the, and to work against them was, it was, um, it was kind of like fire and ice. 
You know, you really wanted to do it, but you knew something bad was going to happen. And all of that put us over that he was trying to ramble through before he started this. He says, yeah, we put you over in Gainesway. He didn't put me over. He stretched me. I went from five foot, ten and a half on my driver's license to the next time it was six foot and a half inch. Gerald stretched me. He looks nice, and he's always smiling like that. But remember that song? Smiling faces, hide no traces of the evil that lurks within. Can you dig it? Can you dig it? You still had to learn to sing it after all these years. I've heard yeah, you. Yeah. I've heard you sing it. I've heard you sing it in every state of of, of darkness. I can hear you sing it. <laughs> well, that was a real compliment. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, John, yeah, John, we were down at some remote island, and he was so excited because St. Martin's. St. Martin's. And we went, went to tie up. It's one of the most simple things we there is. We just lost any fan we might have in St. Martin. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's a good. That St. Martin's a beautiful place, man. Okay. I love St. Martin's. <laughs> we didn't see. We flew in there. It was dark. And we flew out. It was dark. What do you like about it? You remember when we flew in there, the people chasing the airplane because uh, Rocky Johnson was on the plane? I'm talking about Daddy Rocky Johnson, too. Yeah, yeah, I do they remember chased, that. They chased the plane all the way down the damn runway. We thought yeah, they were going to turn the plane over. Well, that's that kind of stuff it kind of scares me, where you were thinking that was a cool deal. I thought it was the coolest thing I'd ever – I thought I was a beat. I thought it was Paul McCarthy. Yeah. <laughs> or John Lennon, one of those guys. I think you look more like Ringo Starr that got Well, I could have been nose. Ringo Starr. I am talented, man. <laughs> but anyway, tell the story about knocking me out and, and okay. breaking my head. Let me, I'll condense it. We're okay. there. <laughs> it, we're there. It was, um, the audience was full, but it wasn't a big place. It was outdoors and it was like built into the side of a mountain. And the, the bleachers collapsed too, man. Yeah, they set too many people on them bleachers, but they were just, I mean, you know, they were excited. When you go to the islands, I mean, I used to love to go to the Bahamas, went there all the time. And I mean, it wasn't like a great arena there, but it was like a lot of fun to be there at the islands. So, but we went to St. Martin's, we got in the ring. And I'd already been stretched a few times in prior matches by Gerald. I mean, Jack beat me up pretty good, but he didn't stretch me. I mean, you know, when you're getting stretched, there's no defense. You can't, like, even fire back when your arms are both up over your head. But I went to lock up with Gerald, and I was excited. I meant I was a little excited, but I'm always excited at the beginning of the match. So when I locked up, he tripped. He started to fall. <laughs> so it's I tried his fault. To, uh, yeah, I tried to catch him, and he headbutted me, but he went down. And as he fell, I, he was so heavy in the upper body because he was so muscular at the time. I dropped him, and his hand just happened to be there, and I stepped on it. And then he pulled my, put, tried to pull up on my leg, and he broke his own hand with my foot on it. Isn't that what happened? So that, much, not, not even close, John. Don't believe it. Now, now, Steve, how can we believe anything about your book after you just lied on that damn story? <laughs> now, wait, a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. In defense of, of uh, Steve's book. There ain't no defense. No, no, there is defense. He is the only person I think that's ever written a book that has not embellished throughout the entire book. And yeah. embellished is a nice word for lie. Yeah, so, I mean, that's, well, you know what I said? I said, you never have to rehearse the truth. And so if somebody's ever questioning anything you say, you don't really have to get in a conflict. You know what your truth is of your, what your side of your opinion and a whole deal. But at the same time, it's not like you have to keep stepping on lies. So if you tell the truth the first time, but that time was a little stretch of the truth. <laughs> yeah, it's a little, yeah. <laughs> when Mr. Briscoe broke his own nose and hand, Nah, well, he did. He didn't get his nose broke. He just got. Not he that just got time, knocked, anyway. He got knocked out, but it was only for a split second, because I tried to cover him, but he kicked <laughs> out on two. <laughs> well, anyway, I was, he was talking about Gainesville earlier. I remember. I remember uh, at Gainesville, he and Jack were on the outside, and me and Mike were on the inside. 
All of a sudden, Mike tries one of those moves on me, and I caught him, man. I, I got lucky, and I caught him. Pulled his chair back, put my hand over his face. You've had that happen to you, John. I certainly have. But, so, but, and, and had him flat on his back. All of a sudden, I see uh, Steve and Jack just quit working, and Steve did it, just laughing his ass off about Mike, you know, being smothered to death <laughs> under this advice there. But, yeah, we had some great matches. We had some great times working with it. Get away from my food, dog. Summer, <laughs> get away from my food. What? Barbara? Barbara, come get that dog. I'll get no, my not, food. Not so the, the dog, dog on camera, the other dog. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, my dog. I got a dog. My Where's my dog? Yeah. I see JBL with his dog on Facebook all the time. I love my dog. My dog. I got the dumbest dog in the world. He's 14. His name's Max. He's a miniature dachshund that when I went to get him for my wife, I'm, I'm in Land of Lakes and I go up and it's a chain link fence around the front yard of this house. And here they come with the dog. It's the last dog in the litter. And the kid's already saying to me, we'll take $200 from them. They wanted $250. And I go, uh-oh. But this dog is it has no sense. It, it can't hear now. He's so old. We had teeth pulled on him. He had 17 teeth pulled at one time. Wow. He never learned any tricks. He can't <laughs> sit. He can't roll over. He doesn't even walk on a leash because he's got some kind of throwback, like ridge back on a little bit back. And he never had a collar on. If you put a collar on him, he turns into a statue. At 14 years old, he's just here. But at the same time, I love my dog. He's an old Max. Oh, if he no. walks by, yeah. if he if he walks by, I'll pick him up and show him to you. But you can't call him. He's like a cat. You call him, he's deaf. He's just like <laughs> you know, he just have to get lucky and he walked by. Mr. Briscoe, right, you you're on mute. You're on mute, Mr. Briscoe. What is wrong with you? How many how many weeks in a row have you done this show? <laughs> My do that dog that I went as is uh, my dad before he died. Steve uh, rescued yeah. the dog, and so I'm kidding. Dog. Yeah, yeah. So uh, dad loved that dog. Oh yeah. man, that that's a blessing in itself. We ended up with my mom's dog, but it was my mom and dad's. My dad died earlier than my mom, and then my mom lived on. And then when she died, um, you know, the, the the dog came downhill and everything. So yeah, you got you know that's. This is, you know, be honest with you, this is my last dog. And the reason is, is it's so sad, man, the ending. Oh, it's terrible. You wish they lived yeah. to be seven oh, years Oh, man, old. I wish mine died naturally, like laid down and died. But they get to the point where, you know, they're, they, they're walking around and they just go to the bathroom and they run into stuff and they're, they're lost because they're blind, whatever, and, you know, the vet says, well, if this was my dog, I'd put him down and let him go out of his misery, you know, and they go, are they eating? Is he eating? Yeah, he eats great. Does this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, keep him alive. And then you have to put him to sleep. Oh, uh, it's the you worst. Know? It's absolutely yeah. the worst. Yeah, yeah. So, anyway. Where did Gerald go? Did he just quit? He's probably taking a nap. He this is. is about to, it's about time for a nap. We can't, Gerald, I can't hear you. You're on mute. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even have a picture of him anymore. <laughs> good lucky lucky you steve i yeah. had, I, I had a cat uh that i rescued in bermuda brought it with me love this little cat right beside me it's, it's right there right now and right. it got it got where it couldn't walk it would fall over fall over fall over fall over and but right. it, was purring, it was purring the whole time so it was happy it wasn't in pain nothing right and the, right and the vet said i don't know what's wrong with it i took it had every cancer test you could have all this kind of stuff nobody could figure out what's wrong with it said it must have some type of cancer we can't figure out it probably doesn't have but a few days to live. I said, okay. So I was with it all the time. And I went to a little sports bar and got some ribs, but I wanted to come back because I didn't know how long the, you know, the cat would make it through the day. And so I sat down, put the ribs down. I went to go get something and the cat hadn't eaten in days. I come back and the ribs are picked completely clean. The cat had eaten all the ribs and I'm sat there looking at them. Well, maybe it likes ribs. So I went and got it some more and ate more ribs. Went and the next day I got some more. It started walking again. It started quitting, his belly quit swelling up. So the vet calls me a month later and says, hey, I just want to let you know, I hadn't heard from you. I assume that your, your cat passed away. I said, no, it's healthy as it could be. He goes, you're kidding me. And I said, no. The only thing the vet can figure out was that its lymph system had shut down 
and somehow right. started eating again, that it kicked back in because every doctor that I went to has called me and said, Hey, sorry about your cat. I said, no, it's healthy as it could be. It's now jumping up and down, running around. Nobody can figure out why, except, except for the ribs. Well, you know, that's the whole thing. It, it all boils around medicine and doctors and all of that, because even pets and animals, I mean, you know, having pets all my life, I've always, we've always had a dog. I mean, we've had a few cats, but not as many as we have had dogs, but you know, you're surrounded by that. But uh, you know, the, the, th the sad part is, is, you know, when they get sick, you don't know how to talk to them. You don't yeah. you know how to ask, Hey, what's wrong with you? How come you got diarrhea? I mean, you know, but at the same time, it's the same with adults. I go to doctors now as an older guy to make sure because that I just went in for a checkup at an ENT, looked at my Chinese lady doctor looks in my throat. Oh, you got cancer. I'm going, ah, I said, I just come to get checked for a cold. <laughs> and so I believe in just getting checked all the time for everything ahead of the game. I don't, you know, you know, you're going to get something sooner or later. So why not cut it down shorter? But you don't know who to trust anymore. I mean, one of the first, I'm the worst, worst. If you were a doctor, you would hate me. When I go into a doctor, I'm brutal. I go in there like as a real heel. First thing when they say they want to do something. So where'd you go to college? What kind of grades, what kind of grades did you make? You ever cheat on any exams? Were you in a fraternity? I mean, you know, like how many years did it take you to get through med school? I mean, give me a phone number for two or three people exactly like me that you worked on and I could talk to. I mean, you know, they all go, no, I ain't doing that. And the one guy says, I, I answered every question except for, did I ever cheat on an exam? He said, I never, nobody asked me that. I said, well, I'm interested. I ain't here to be your friend. I'm looking for a really good doctor. And I hope you're a real geek, as a matter of fact, because that means that you studied more. So, but... But, you know, your cat getting well, that makes me think, you know, one 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 doctor tells you, you could, they can eat this. The other doctor tells you, don't let them have this. I mean, you know, it's the same with what for, you know, I'm 72. At one point, drink milk, all oh, strong bones and muscles and all that. Next, oh, it makes you fat. Oh, oh, you know, oh, no, it'll kill you. I mean, you know, then it comes back, oh, milk's good again now. So... I guess, you know, it's a little bit of a roll of the dice. But yeah, I think that's why they call it practicing medicine. <laughs> that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Well, so Gerald just quit altogether. Yeah, Gerald quit all. He, I can see him right there, but he he doesn't, uh, his mute, his voice is gone. And Jerry, Steve, we've been doing this for two years. It always goes wrong on Gerald's end. Well... <laughs> I'm not going to say anything because I know he can still hear me and he's watching me, you know, so he might not forget what I would say. So I'm going to make sure I, I watch my words, but I oh, I got this camera gimmick thing here trying to get it to sit still too. All of a sudden it decided it wanted to lean over. Sorry about that. Well, let's get back to some questions. I guess now let's, Gerald get, just, now let's get back to the hey. book. Since uh, Gerald is still trying to figure out his, uh, <laughs> Okay. Mute button. <laughs> I can't believe this. So uh, tell me about the book. I know you, the first book you had, well, your, your dad's book, a fantastic okay. story about your all dad, right. the, the reason the, behind this book and all that. The thing about the book is, is, you know, when I was asked by several different, you know, friends have asked me, Hey, how come you don't write a book? You got so many stories, man. You went through four generations of wrestling. You know, you just didn't come in and wrestle for a generation or two or whatever, and then go off and whatever. And the Indies, you went through this, you went through that, you went through the transition from the, the territorial days into the cable days. You ended up being an agent, you ran businesses and the, and the thing. So I have a long history in the business and I'm, <clears throat> I made a lot of friends and it's like when I go to the matches, if, if Raw's in town or AEW or whatever it is, if I go down there to see the guys in the back, Brian and Blair will say, how come so many different generations know you? It's because somehow or another, I went through them. I went through them, whether I was in talent, whether I was in an agent, whether I was in the teaching or whatever, but it was my only knowledge was wrestling. So I had to kind of stick with it. 
And when I tried to transition out of it, it, I didn't fit. I mean, you know, I couldn't find something productive enough to have a family and kids and support them and put them through college and all that. So it kept going back to wrestling. Well, when I, when I started the book, I didn't want to just start off, you know, okay, I'm in wrestling now. So we started off with a little bit of my childhood growing up because it had set a, pre, a prerequisite for telling about my dad because my dad was a little bit of my motivation to write the book. My dad had written a book, Two-Time Prisoner of War. I can't remember everything he went through to tell the story after he's gone. The book, having a book at home, my, my children, my grandchildren, every, everybody can kind of like find the history. Well, they started comparing it to that, but all the wrestling books I, I had read, you know, they, they were all good, but I kind of knew the stories, you know, you were there. And so it wasn't as interesting to me. And I'm thinking, and I'm a realist, John. I'm thinking, you know, who cares about Steve Kern and re reading his book? I mean, you know, he didn't, you know, do something special. He was just, a, you know, I was just a soldier in the wrestling business is what I was. And I knew that. I was just one of those guys that fit in here, fit in there, got a couple of opportunities, went from here to there, here to there, here to there. But I wasn't an icon, so who's going to buy my book? So then at the very beginning, I thought, well, you know what? I'll put a hook in the book. I'll do something that'll drive it to two audiences. Instead of just wrestling fans, I will drive it to military people, too. And I was at the beginning, I was going to put a picture of my dad, two-time POW, and write two-time POW to professional wrestler. But then I was going to write in little small letters at the top, son of two-time P.O.W. <laughs> so right. that would, yeah, so somebody walking by and go, oh, man, that's a P.O.W. two-time. <laughs> that's right. He turned pro wrestler? I'm going to read this. You got to read the fine print that said the son of a two-time <laughs> P.O.W. But then reality was, is I knew that this was not going to go on every bookstore, on every publishing thing, on everything, that it's going to be an opportunity that I could do a book and have something recorded for my grandchildren, my children's children, whatever it is. And so when I, when I did it, I didn't want to make up stuff that makes me sound like I should have been Hulk Hogan or um, The Rock or somebody, you know, I wanted to make it sound like Okay, this is what an average guy went through the wrestling business, and then he had opportunities, and he had downfalls, and he had uh, injuries, and he had heartaches, and you know he struggled, and I mean you know he saw drugs, he saw alcohol, he saw everything that you could possibly see. But my objective was was not to really trash people. I mean you know you and I both know we know a lot of stuff. People would really like to know. <laughs> yeah yeah but but i gotta be honest my lips are sealed because it, when i was broke into this business and in the, in the era i was broke in, i was broke in under a word called kayfabe and to me that encompassed more than our action in the wrestling business that encompasses our public reaction too because that i've been in public situations where i've looked at talent and said hey kayfabe I mean, you know, and it wasn't about your move. It's about what you're saying because it reflects on all of us. I pick out three or four guys. I trash them. I drag drugs and sex and all the things that I was a part of and act like I didn't have anything to do with it. Then who am I? And that judges our whole business. And I don't want that. I'm so proud of so many friends I have, including you and Gerald and it's countless, countless friends I have that I can reach out to. It doesn't have to be every day. It can be like you. I'll drop something. If I see something funny, I think you'll get a smile out of. I don't need you to respond. I just need you to smile. And I know you did. And I, I'm, I'm complete. But that's a vast army of family and friends. And why pick out a few bad things that happen to reflect on? So I try to stay away from that. Only had one one conflict one time where it said somebody said something. Well, I wish you wouldn't have said so much about some older guy. Well, I kind of got pinned in where somebody asking me the questions and I'm writing a book and says, Did you ever have any bad matches? And I'm going, Of course. <laughs> and then who would you say? And I picked out Bunk Harris. 
in Carolinas. And, and I was a young guy in 1974. I'd only been in the business two years and I'm in the territory and they ended up teaming me with Tiger Conway Jr. But when I first went in there, my guy to work the loops with was Bonk Harris. And it was a nightmare. And, and so I kind of reflected on, you know, well, I knew a couple of things because the locker room talked that he was a big stooge. Watch what you say, watch how you act. And he would critique the match afterward and tell me to do this and do that. And John, you know, even though it was only two years, I already knew he's giving me crappy advice. So I mentioned a few things. And so that was the only thing that I said in a, in the book. And and I and I'm not my objective is not to use a book as a tool to downcast. Mine is to educate because that I know that there's a lot of young people breaking in the wrestling business and they want to be in the wrestling business, but they don't know the real story. They don't know. And they're gonna hear a real story that's not going to reflect because history changes. It's not territorial days when I started all the way up to the fabulous ones. And then the next section, it's cable days and, you know, WWF days and those kind of days. And so it's a totally different business. And when I owned FCW and was in charge of the whole developmental, then it was another whole different business. So I've seen these four generations of changes and, you know, somebody that just worked, They'll see what they remember, what they did, and what they saw before them. But then all of a sudden, they're watching now, and they go, what in the hell are they doing? I mean, you know, I count the two counts. That's what I do if I watch any wrestling now. I go, one, two, there's a two count. One, two, there's a two count. One, two, there's a two count. And I see if there's any one counts, you know, or <laughs> anything I mean, that's how bored I am with some of the times that I watch. But at the same time, I get it. I get it. Times change. The world's changed. I mean, you know, it's an evolution that's going forward. And if you jump in now, you get it. But if you're jumping in from the past, you're going like, well, what are they doing? I don't understand. Why did they did 10, 10 moonsaults in four matches? I mean, you know. But that's, but that's just not understanding what they go through. And my, my kind of excuse for them is this. When I started as a kid in 1972, the, the, the action heroes were like Clint Eastwood, John Wayne, Charles Bronson. I mean, you know, <clears throat> Steve McQueen. And in an action movie, they maybe beat up a guy, maybe shot one guy, maybe got it got some they got heat on the baby face for a short time the comeback was usually you know the guy dies or goes to jail at the end if you watch you know any action movie now <clears throat> in a comparable i mean keanu reeves he kills like 92 people in 30 <laughs> seconds <clears throat> and so that's what wrestling's evolved to is trying to outdo the past or trying to get new or trying to get better or trying to change or whatever. So it's just what's happening. So Steve, you've done every single part of the wrestling business. What was your favorite part? Wrestling. Being by in far. a talent. <clears throat> by, by far, none. After that, everything was miserable. I was miserable as an agent. I hated being an agent. I was going to work. And I didn't have fun and I didn't enjoy it because I was under the pressure of Vince and his thumb in that gorilla position and answering for a match I'm not even doing. And, and it was like, you know, I was, it was out of my realm. But I had to do what I had to do because I still, like I keep mentioning, I had a wife, I have two kids. My son's a doctor now because it, not because it, I did anything except for keep a job so I could keep support and whatever. My daughter's a very successful IT. She gra graduated from college. So their education was paid for by working and, and whatever it took. And going to work before as a talent, here's the deal. When you got your match and you talk to your opponent, if you, in territory days, we didn't get to talk before our matches. But in times where you could talk to your match, and you got through a match and the audience was entertained and felt like you gave him your heart. And then you came back and your opponent thanked you and the boys in the dressing room. If you earn the respect for them to stand up and say, Hey man, great match, man, that was the, that was the ultimate, but everything was on you. 
you, you're responsible for what you just did out there. You're responsible for not hurting anybody in that ring. You're responsible for being part of whatever that entertainment was in the audience. You're responsible. You. After that, you're done. Put your clothes on, get in the car, and go home. But And being an agent was endless. I mean, you know, you got called after the matches. You had to do meetings before. You had to do meetings after. And then I thought I'd made it when I, I broke away by working the workers and say, man, I'm burnt out. I can't go to Europe another time and be an agent. I'm burnt out. Oh, well, how'd you like to stay home every night? Oh, yeah, that sounds great. Are you just going to pay me to retire? Yeah, no, you're going to run the developmental. Oh, great. That was a big rib. <laughs> running, the, running the developmental was another nightmare. It's very rewarding to see success. And we had so many success stories. But all of those success stories has a failure story that goes with it. And those failure stories are more damaging to me than the success stories. And the reason why is because that I actually answered phones late at night, sometimes young men or young women crying, Steve, what I, they just sent me my release. What do I do? I don't know. Well, yeah, that's I mean, you know, where do, where do I go? What do I do? I've spent my whole life wanting to do this. And now I just, and I don't know why I'm being released. They just released me. Okay, well, I don't know why either, but maybe you should try Puerto Rico or Japan or, or find somebody that's working other places. I don't know. I don't have the answers. I'm not dealing with that. I'm dealing with trying to teach. And even when I taught John, I didn't teach moves. John, um, Tom Pritchard and Norman Smiley were the, actually doing physical movement. Dusty was doing the promos, the best ever. And I mean, they had the greatest instructors in the world. But what I did was I sat down with them and I talked to them about here. You want to know what you really need to know about wrestling? You know, oh, Mr. Kern, can you teach me a thousand moves? Dean Malenko knows a thousand one. I can teach you a thousand and ten, but how many are you going to use in a six minute match? You don't want to know what you really need to know. You want to know how to get along. You want to know how to not get heat in a dressing room that can reflect on your career and be a domino effect on what you do. You can be the greatest worker. You can have the greatest body. You can be the greatest interview person in the world. But if you don't fit in and you're not able to adjust and go by the rules that they're already set, then you're not going to fit in and it's going to be a miserable. And then plus, you're going to have to hand your body to somebody every night. And if you don't know how to treat them to show them respect that they will give you respect and treat you the same way back, then you're not going to make it. I don't care who teaches you 90 million moves out there. I said, the real stuff you need to know is how to be able to adapt to this life you're getting into. It's not like any other pro sport. I'm not a pro football player turned wrestler. I'm not a pro baseball player. I'm not an Olympic athlete turned wrestler. But I was a wrestler all my life, and I know one thing. If you if you don't have family attached in here for the nepotism part of this business, you're a minnow in a sea of sharks, bottom line. Because we're playing king on the mountain in this business, brother. And every time you're going up that mountain, somebody's trying to grab your leg and pull you down. And sometimes you're not smart enough to recognize it. Sometimes it can be your own fault because you're being a cocky guy climbing that mountain pole. Sometimes it's just somebody don't like you. I mean, you know, there's a lot of things you under need to understand. So that's where I came into play. I mean, you know, you, you <laughs> me and Norman would laugh so hard with talent because we would see the things that you thought you'd never see. I remember one time we were in teaching reverses on movement. So, so going through chain wrestling, stand up, take an arm, reverse the arm, hammer lock, reverse the hammer lock. Me and Norman are calling. So no, I, Norman's saying, I got these two guys are really good. They're really, <laughs> he's I've been working with them all morning. So I, so I got, I'm calling it. So they're in there and I go, they hammer lock and they got hammer lock. So I said, reverse. I look. And I said, freeze. And I said, Norman, come here. 
and they both had reversed the hammer lock. Now they're hammer locked to each other backwards. So they're standing in the middle of the ring, hammer locked with each other. I go, man, I had to show you this because that movement was movement. You know, because of your your accomplishments in the business and your time in the business, because it comes second nature. Movement becomes second nature. Yeah. I mean, if you want to add something fancy, you find somebody that you don't tell, hey, I'm going to try something tonight on you. You just do it. And yeah. if it doesn't, and if it doesn't work, then you kind of maybe explain, well, I hadn't done that before, so I just <laughs> want to see what happened. Or you don't don't even bring it up. It's better not to mention it. Oh, yeah, what's yeah, the last yeah, yeah, you just kind of gloss over it. <laughs> yeah. The last time I did that, it worked. I don't know what it, what you did. You must have moved. I always anyway. thought when you got some couple guys out there and you say, are you okay? You're not asking, are you okay? You're asking, how mad are you? Yeah. <laughs> you know they're okay. <laughs> yeah. I, a lot of times when I'm talking about the wrestling business, they'll say something to me. This is what, what's the most common word in, in wrestling? And I go, I'm sorry. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And they go, what hey, is Mr. that? Briscoe, said, are you still muted? You're the one that hooks up everybody on this. You're our tech advisor. <laughs> I'm sure he's saying something. You know, Steve, uh, talk about being an agent. I was a coach one year in junior college, played a little football with coach one year, and we had a linebacker that was a stud. I mean, absolutely still were playing against the linebacker. So we put a red jersey to mimic the linebacker, and it said, if he ever gets in the A-gap, disregard everything you're doing, block the A-gap. Every all week long, all we did was talk about that linebacker, a gap, block the a gap. Sure enough, the first play of the game, that linebacker gets in the a gap. I go, no, no worries. We've gone over this every day, all week long. Sure mm -hmm. enough, the guard blocks out, the center blocks away, and he kills our quarterback. No one blocked him. And the coach looked at me and he goes, What did you do all week? I'm like, Apparently, nothing. <laughs> I wasn't paying attention. I wasn't paying attention to you. <laughs> yeah. It's just the worst. You know, being, being an agent, which I was for a short period of time, you know, you're, you're, you, you tell people what you think's best and you think it works and you tell them what the, you lay the message from the office. And then if it doesn't work, you're to blame. <laughs> like, wait a minute. I wasn't. That, that, that's what, that's I what I was saying there. about. That's what I said about the second part of my career. The second part of my career, the next book that I'm, I'm doing to continue in it, <clears throat> I started off with doing the PWF. And that was a little bit, of, I just wanted to own the wrestling business instead of being a talent because I could see that the real money was being the owner, which was wrong. It didn't work. But then it was going into doing Skinner, which was a whole new thing for me because that, you know, when you were Skinner, you get pros and cons. Some people hate the character. Some people think that it was a, the beginning of my downfall because I'd done so well with the Fabulous Ones gimmick. And then now I went boom because Vince didn't like talent from the past. All kinds of excuses. It was the most fun I ever had in my whole career so far as talent. Now I'm an actor. I'm not Steve Kern for the first time in 20 years. Now I'm Skinner. And I had more fun doing the vignettes and I had done the alligator stuff. So it was kind of semi shoot going out there. But at the same time, I was having a blast. The vignettes coming out from underwater, pretending I was one of the guys from the movie Deliverance. I mean, you know, and then uh, Doink wasn't a, wasn't a smart idea on my part. But, you know, it was only for a short time with Matt there. And then after that, going into WCW for a four short stint, and then uh, there I am in the uh, agent business, and I'm out of the business as far as talent-wise. I can remember John Laronitis saying to me when I was an agent one time, he says, Steve, um, we want you to be Skinner. We're going to do a Legends Battle Royal on Monday Night Raw. And I'm looking, I said, John, I don't work. And he goes, what? I said, no, I vowed. When I got to a certain age, I wasn't working no more. And he goes, well... And he wrote down a figure on a piece of paper and he said, well, would you consider it? And then he wrote down a figure of a payoff and I go, I guess I'm back to work. And <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's right. That's right. <laughs> you know, okay, well, you know, okay. The bone went waving from, but it was just a one-time battle all. but it was like, not interested. I'm not interested in being a talent. 
but that the, the miserable part about it was is I was stressed out all the time. By the time I really burnt out at FCW with all the, you know, things, you know, I had to come out. This is something I wish you'd have been there as a visitor one day to see this thing. But, you know, when you build the building and you design the whole thing about your arena, your gym, the whole thing, you take pride in Well, the talent, the guys are going to pee. And at, at the urinals, they just pee all over the wall. They pee all over the floor. They didn't, and they'd leave the toilets stopped up. And then they'd come out complaining that the toilets were stopped there. There'd be a plunger sitting right beside. I would have to cut them out and put them all in the arena, cut a promo on them about clean up after yourself. I'm going, you know, this is part of what you need to know. Who do you think in a dressing room is going to want to share a dressing room with you if you go in there crapping a the toilet and you're not, you're too lazy, you won't even flush it. I mean, you know, so little things like that were a constant, a constant. And here's what I did. You know, there's no real paying your dues to get in the business. And so it's different when I started, but I don't try to compare it to that. But what I did was I said, well, I'm going to give them something. And I made them do, put out window cards where they drive to the towns a week ahead of time and hang posters all over the towns. And they complained about that at the very end when they finally said, well, Steve's retiring. We're done with him. And they go, well, you'll never have to put out another window card. They got the biggest cheer about that. And I'm thinking that was the only thing you had to pay and do is to get in this business and you're making millions of dollars. And you're complaining about putting out the window card, you know, so. Yeah, you know, anyway. and I think it's almost, a, I don't know about a disservice, but certainly a disadvantage to today's guys that and girls that come into wrestling because you don't have the paying of the dues, but you also don't have that education process of going yeah. through territories and learning how to get over in a million different places and learning a million different styles. And, you know, by the time we got the WWE, you know, we had had, a thousand or 2000 matches. These guys have 10 or 15 matches. I mean, look at this, look at this young guy, um, Logan Paul. I think he's fantastic, but I don't know how he does it. You know, he, it's, it's just, it's amazing that uh, he goes out there and does the things that he does and gets over the way he gets over because there's not that educational background to, it. I think it's just a big disadvantage to today's wrestlers of not having what we had. No. Well, you know, a lot of it was education in cars. I mean, you know, education by different talent from all different generations at that point that had all kinds of experience from all different places. And then the other thing, 365 days a year work and plus every 52, 52 times a week in the same city. You had to be creative. You had to be different. You couldn't be the same person. You couldn't, re you had to remember what you worked the last time. You had to, you know, come out and be different each time so they didn't get tired of seeing you. So, you know, we were educated different. Now they were, they, you know, it, it's like I, I could sit here and talk about it all day long, but it's like I don't want to miss it, can, can screw it that I'm, you know, have any kind of, you know, um, opinion so far as that it be good or bad to me success is success if it if it's what people like that's what they yeah, like and that's so, that's one thing yeah. i think steve you know you look at i don't know if the generation before me looked down at my generation they probably did every, every generation tends to think the next generation sure. ruining the business mr briscoe shaking his head because he's still on mute <laughs> but yeah, can you hear me i hear you now yes great fantastic but you know are we going to start you, now you look yeah, yeah we're, we're done okay steve thanks for coming on but you you look you look at this generation now and everybody the the the, the smart thing is to bash them you know you, you never get any nobody ever comes out and says boy this group is great because somebody says oh wait a minute wait a minute remember roddy piper remember jack briscoe what about the time with pat o'connor you know that's the smart thing to do they're drawing massive crowds I mean, they sold out texas stadium back to back 80 something thousand people back to back and so it's like they're doing something very well yeah well you know it's a little bit of supply and demand now that i believe they don't come on a regular basis but at the same time it's a like the globe trotters when i was a kid the globe trotters only came through the area once a year 
and they always did well, but you were really excited about seeing them. If you had to see the Globe Trotter seven, I mean, you know, 52 times a year, the, the thrill would be gone. And I know they talked about they're going to have Royal Rumble here in St. Petersburg at Tropicana Field coming up next year. So they're, they're already trying to beef it up and stuff like that, but they'll probably sell it out. I mean, the, yeah. de, um, the Tampa Bay Rays can't sell out that Tropicana. <laughs> and they're good. And, they're and good. yeah, and they're, and they're getting ready to rebuild it, tear it all the way down and build a whole new thing. They just funded it. And they did that. That's been the local news. Steve, Steve introduces to Skinner Jr. there. Where'd hey, he go? Asher. Asher. Where are you, buddy? Come here. This is Asher. This is my youngest grandson. Come here. Come up can here. he hunt a gator yet? No, but he can get in a bad mood. <laughs> can, can he skin a gator? No, he can't skin it. Wave at him. Wave. Wave at Gerald. <laughs> Nah, he just got picked up from daycare. He, he goes till 12 o'clock, and then Terry and I watch him every day. This is my man. Does, the parents, my, does his parents know that? <laughs> I, uh, I've taught all my grandkids. I'm, not, I'm limited on education, but I can teach them to swim. You, <laughs> should, know, you should know that, Gerald. But yeah, I, you, these, he's, he just turned five August 29th. I, I know should know what? How to swim? No. I make sure that they were able to swim by two years old, unattended, but, you know, like pushing them in the pool, clothed and everything, just like With drowning. Gator, what, gator swimming around. Is that what happened to that gator behind you there? No, but his mother had a um, one of those wakeboards, and she was on the lake and had him with a life preserver pulling him behind the wakeboard on a rope. And his and grandma, my wife, went ballistic, said, what are you doing? She says, I'm just pulling him along behind me in the lake. She says, you know, an alligator come along and just take him away. And boy, I just freaked her out. But you know, and I know our lakes are full of alligators. Of course, I can call. How about when you almost uh, drowned Mr. Briscoe? What was that in the Gulf of Mexico? Or where was that? Which time? <laughs> was that the Gulf See, of Mexico? Actually, it was the Gulf of Mexico. It was in an open water dive. So that was a good testing time to get you know almost drowned. Um, well, you know, there's always two sides to a story. It's the same thing. I shot Barry Wyndham with a nine millimeter in the leg. So everybody wants to bring up when I, oh, oh, tell us about when you shot Barry. And Barry tells a story that I just got out of the car and didn't have it on safety and just shot him in the leg. That ain't even close to the truth. <laughs> But Gerald, it's better, but it's better. Yeah, but Gerald wait a, minute, tells wait a minute. You shot him. He's the victim. He should be allowed to tell the story how he wants. Yeah, but tell the truth. <laughs> I tell the truth when I tell my story. Yeah. Well, no, you don't. You embellish <laughs> you embellish the depth of the water we were in. How we're deep did you? How deep were we? Probably at least 120 foot. Yeah, I I come up behind him. Because it, here's a lead up. I've been diving since I was old enough to ride my butterfly <laughs> handlebar banana seat bicycle. Yeah, Florida boy. Yeah, I, I could drag my tanks and everything right down the road in a wagon and get in the water. And he comes along and they change the laws in the state of Florida. Now, if you want to scuba dive, you got to get a license and go through a course to get As air. you should, as you should. And so I quit getting air and went to free diving. Well, now, he, now he's rubbing this card in my face on every trip. Are you a certified diver? Are you a certified diver? You don't know anything about diving. I'm a certified diver. Where do you buy air? Where do you buy air? Well, I went through. I I went through the certified diver with Jimmy Garvin. I think Jack, um, my wife Terry. We all went and got certified while well in the open Joe water Ledoux. dive. Joe Ledoux. Joe Ledoux. And when we when we <laughs> we went to get the open water dive as in Sarasota and Gerald come along because he's a certified diver. So when we get there, <laughs> we get in the water and he goes down and he's, you know, going through, he goes through every step of checking his tank and getting everything right. And I mean, you know, just, well, he's a he, certified diver. That's <laughs> right. And he had his eyes dotted and his T's crossed, buddy, before he got in the water. And when he got in there, I just, 
I got jumped in and I watched him go to the bottom. And he's looking for seashells. 120 foot below the surface. Yeah. It's like 10 foot deep. <laughs> I went in right behind him. And because you can't turn your head or look back, and there's no peripheral vision past here when you got a tank on and underwater. <clears throat> Gerald's just doing it back and forth with his head looking for seashells. And I eased right down on him. And of course, the regulator and the air is on the top and the back. And I just slowly twisted Gerald's to the <laughs> off position. <laughs> Here I'm 120 foot below sea level and he's yeah. trying to kill me, John. He's it, trying to kill me. It, it's 10 feet deep. <laughs> oh, <laughs> not, Steve. It's so what feet. did he do? What did he do when he ran out of air? Well, listen, <laughs> a tall guy could have just stood up, but he had to come swimming up. Anyway, um, when he ran, I, I, I didn't want I, to get beds. When I when when he when he when I turned off his air, I really kind of hit the gas on my friends, and I kind of made a big half circle and come around so I'm facing him, like I come out of nowhere. And when he sees me, he's messing with his regulator and he's smacking it and he's trying all kinds of stuff. And he and he looks at me and he goes, "I'm certified. Give me a regulator. Give me a regulator." And he's trying to grab my regulator. And I'm going, no, 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 no. And I back away from him and he's going, Don't much for that buddy breather that they taught you in course. Yeah, yeah, no, no, we're not, we're not gonna do that. You're not putting your regulator in my mouth, my mouth and your regulator. Anyway, he's gonna try to get and I I just look at him and I go, go up. Just go up. And boy, he bolted to the top and he come up and he says, Man, I ran out of air, I ran out of air. And of course I had to kind of let him know that. No, you didn't. Let me turn it back on <laughs> for you. <laughs> so, Mr. Briscoe, you almost died. Almost died because of Steve Kern. Here we are. I, I've, I've taken time out of my busy schedule to help these guys get their certification so Steve can legally get a full tank of air. So, uh, we're on this boat. We're out in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. We're probably closer to Texas than we are to Florida. We go down 120 feet in the Gulf of Mexico. We're sailing the site. It's beautiful down there. Coral reefs everywhere, shells everywhere. So I'm hunting for shells because I've already got my card, so I don't need to pay attention to what they're doing. And card sneaks up behind me and turned my damn air off 120 foot deep, John. If you rush up to the top, I don't know if you know anything about dying, but you get bends and you die. I don't want to get bends and die, so I know you got to go up slowly. I have no air. There's a thing called buddy breathing. And if your buddy's supposed to share his regulator with you when you when you run out of air, I tell Steve, I'm giving the international signal. I need air. I need air. And Steve, just like that, shaking his head, no. So what am I going to do? I got to go to the top. So I go to the top, mm -hmm. and then Steve tells, tells me he turned my air off. I want to drown him. <laughs> yeah, we don't, we don't need him. <laughs> That's the problem with talking about ribs. I, I, in my book, I, I go over some ribs and everything because I really got into that ribbon. And yeah, you I, did. I, you were good. I, 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 did I, you I, tell I, the rib about uh, Mr. Perfect? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure. I, I did in the book. I even put a picture of the warrant. I kept the warrant for the arrest and everything. But I, when I told that, that was my greatest of all all time ribs to get it away on Kurt Henning. I mean, you know, so it's like we're in competition there for a while. And <clears throat> anyway, he's a really creative river. So when you rib somebody, you really don't want to announce it, you know, and you really don't want to tell people that you did it. You're responsible because then you become a target. You're targeted by people that want to beat you for a better rib or take the crown. And so it's like later on after the talent in FCW and other places, I went to OVW to scout talent one time with Ted DiBiase and Ted DiBiase stands out in front of them telling them all these ribs I pulled on him. I go to put my pants on after he put my sweatpants off and put my dress pants on and somebody in there had cut the pockets out of my pants. So when I stuck my hand in my pants, all I could feel was skin. 
and everybody's looking at me in, in the locker room when I'm putting my clothes on, but I'm no selling it, man. I'm not going to put it over that somebody cut my pant pockets out, but all it was was just talking, oh, you a great river. Oh, don't ever try to rip. Oh, blah, 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 blah. The next thing I know, I'm being ripped to death. You know what I've done now? I've lived to an age that I rib myself. <laughs> I told Gerald this the other night. Um, we went and watched uh, his son West work, and I told Gerald this the other night. It's like I don't, I don't. I stopped ribbing because it got, you know, it was it got down to just ribbing Brian Blair. I mean, I rib Brian Blair every day, and it was getting old. But he sells so good. But then. <laughs> I started getting on the internet and because I have this book out now, I had to get on and get Facebook and start putting pictures up and all these different things. Well then, you know, with, with that, all of that kind of promotional kind of stuff, I start seeing all these ads on Facebook, an electric bike, $29, $29 for an electric bike. I don't, I don't even want an electric bike, but that's pretty cheap. I'm going to get two. I got one for me and my wife. So I order that. So then I see a bag of silver, 30 pieces of silver, 20 pieces of silver, um, standing Liberty head coins and get 10 free, $168, 200 with shipping. Well, $200 for 30 pieces of silver. Silver is just 23 an ounce right now. Wow, I got to have that. What a deal. I buy that. I buy this little guitar thing. It's a, And this is all on the internet because I'm, I'm, retired right bored i'm looking to oh here's a little thing i always want to learn to play guitar I had a guitar this long it's a fold out thing all it has is the strings right there teaches you how to play the chords you can do it anywhere i get it open it up it don't make any noise it doesn't make a bit of noise so i had the, the silver i had the guitar and the electric bike what else oh the final thing was I, I bought this shark that was a hammerhead shark, four foot long in the picture. Beautiful wall mounting, brushed stainless steel. What a piece of art. I was going to put it out by my swimming pool. I get it. It's that long. It's that long, and it looked like a kid made it in high school shop. <laughs> then, so I've started ribbing. I started buying stuff, and then I remembered my dad. When my dad got older and was retired, he lives in Melbourne, Florida. He's buying a bunch of crap. And when I go visit him, my dad's got a gold eagle on a chain around his neck. And I'm going, damn, dad, that's a lot. That's a gold. And then I picked it up as turning green and everything. I said, why did you buy that? He says, well, it's pure gold. They told me. I said, yeah, well, it's not. But then I started thinking, well, I've taken advantage of him. So then I realized where it's at. I'm a senior citizen. I'm a big target. Because I could buy stuff. If it looks inviting to me, what are you no, showing? Doing, me? Jerry, what are you showing? This is what he bought the other day. He's going to send to me. Oh, yeah. It. You see those? Yeah. Now you see them on, 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 on Facebook. They're Native American pants, and he, he, he bought a dozen pairs. <laughs> <laughs> I told him, I said, between, What is the difference between Native American pants and, and regular pants? Well, well they, they, they're, 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 they're Indian decorated. pants. They got the yeah. little fringe that runs out of the side, like Pocahontas or whoever, <laughs> Tom Sawyer, whatever they're Indian. Would, Tom Sawyer then, wasn't Indian. Okay, hey, well. Hey, hey, Steve, speaking of crown uh, and ribs, uh, uh -oh. I, I don't know if, <laughs> you know, might, might know where I'm going with this. There's <laughs> could be a crown yeah. that got a rib <laughs> one time that uh, maybe not you don't wear, maybe. <laughs> You know what's funny about that, Steve? I, I know uh, it, you told me it was before. Heenan was the one that ended up stooging you by mistake, right? I went 10 years. I went 10 years. Blamed it on Kurt Henning for 10 years. He was the one for 10 years. And Bobby Heenan wrote his second book <laughs> and told the whole story. Stooged me off. Tell the about... story. Tell the story so everybody share the story with Um. Well, see, here's here's. <laughs> I, I the only problem I have with these stories are some, when somebody's still alive, it rubs them wrong when they hear <laughs> hear the story. But we were in um, WWF. Oh, just um, use Brian's name, and we, we won't worry about it. Yeah, use Brian's name. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that'll fit real good with the crown. Um, <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, we were at, we were at a Royal Rumble, and I believe it was in San Francisco or Sacramento or somewhere. Anyway, the city don't really matter, but Lawler came into the territory for the first time, and on the pay per view, and it was um, where you you just everybody goes to the ring. Is that the Royal Rumble where you go one right after another? Royal Rumble, yeah, yeah, Royal Rumble. Anyway, so I was in there. Kurt was in there. Anyway, so before we're sitting in the dressing room, hey, guess who's back? Yeah. Guess who's back? <laughs> anyway. We're in the dressing room, and because Lawler had had some heat with some of the guys, everybody's going, oh, we should do something. We should do something. So we came up with this bright idea, which was a kind of a old standby for ribbon guys. Was in, in the old days, when you went into a lot of high school gyms, they had those lockers with the padlocks, and if you flip around or whatever, you'll find one that's not locked. And we'd take those off, and we'd lock somebody's bag to something. I locked Kevin Sullivan's bag to a folding chair one time, and he had to carry that out of the building. But we'd lock stuff. So I had a padlock. So we put a padlock on the crown. That's good. Hey, all right. Here comes Mr. Fuji. Hey, go go tell Grandma you need to talk to her. You don't need to hear this rib. Go ask Grammy for something <laughs> to drink. <laughs> Because he'll do this now, Timmy. This is not anyway. What he he doesn't get to listen to swords with Briscoe and Bradshaw podcast. No, that's why these headphones are on. <laughs> he can hear what I'm saying, but he can't hear you. <laughs> anyway, so Fuji comes in, and me and me and Kurt we point over to the crown sitting over there by the bag, and he's going, "Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, maybe better you shit in the crown." <laughs> And I looked at Kurt and I go, I don't know about you, but I don't just do that on command. I mean, you know, this is the middle of the afternoon. It's a definitely a morning thing after coffee. And after that, it's not, it just don't pop up whenever I feel like it. Anyway, so, so Kurt's trying to, and I'm holding the crown and he's grunting and straining. You're holding the crown for Kurt? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We're, hey, we got a we got a smart locker room there, real smart locker okay. room there. Okay, well here's the thing, you can't just hold it and do it at the same time. So you got to put all your effort into holding your arms up. So I'm holding it. He's nothing, nothing, nothing. So in the process, all of a sudden I feel. <laughs> oh, I so wish there was a security camera footage of that. Oh my so, god. So you're oh, down, you're trying to see where the droppage is. How do you drop the <laughs> Listen. Listen, this is better because it you know how stalls and bathrooms are all lined up right there? Well, all the doors were shut. And I, we and Kurt think we're the only two in the bathroom at this time trying to do this, right? Fuji has sent us off. Go crap in the crown. Okay, so we go in there now, Kurt. Having everything he had, nothing. Or maybe he ribbed me again, and I. he says, you try. So I try. But I felt a movement. All of a sudden, I felt a movement from out of nowhere. And it was. It was a big pile of mud, man. And it come right out of me. <laughs> hey, Kurt, and then, Kurt's holding the crown? Yeah, Kurt's he's collecting holding it. Yeah, and he's freaking out. <clears throat> you think? <laughs> yeah, because he's like, he's key. here's his coaching. Come on, a little bit more, a little bit more. Man, I filled the whole bottom up. I don't know what more we need here. I said, uh, we're lucky to get this. So now whenever you go, whenever you go number two, automatically number one comes with it. So now I'm bent over in the, in the bathroom, but I'm not in a toilet. And so I push open the door to pee, and there's one of the Beverly brothers. Mike Enos is sitting on the toilet, and he'd watch the whole thing through the crack. And he's laughing his ass off. But then when I turned the thing, I got to pee. So I peed in between his legs and peed all over his boots. But anyway, it was a, it was one of those monumental moments. But I was clean. I mean, you know, that whole thing went undetected for 10 years. And it was always when somebody said, hey, I heard a rib you and Kurt pulled. I said, yeah, he crapped in Waller's crowd. And then later on, Bobby Eaton goes, no, that's not the true story. <laughs> So, <laughs> did King uh, did King ever confront you over that? 
Um, no, but we weren't really buddy buddy. I mean, you I, know, I, I don't know why. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, since then, I found a, a whole different Steve myself. You know, and I, you know, I'm I'm a different person. When I was young, you know, I, was, I thought I was, you know, smart. And it wasn't until I got old that I got smartened up. I mean, you know, um, it's not just being a Christian and my walk with Jesus. It's about reality of, you know, how to treat people. And, you know, the things I did were funny and, and things. But at the same time, you know, life's, life's changed. And I feel sorry for Jerry the King Lawler. And the reason I do is because... When you lose a son, like he did, and his kid was a great kid. He had some. He was a great kid. He had some demons in his closet. But you look and you tell me, when you see that kid smiling in a picture, or whatever, it doesn't warm your heart because I'm I'm turned on by smiles, and he had the greatest smile. Brian and, was the nicest young guy. I everybody liked Brian. Brian would laugh and joke and rib and it just he just he just enjoyed life and people enjoyed Brian being around. He was funny, he was smart. You know, it was it was Brian Christopher was a really good guy. Yes, he was, and he was always good to me. Whatever he did with anybody else or whatever yeah. story was, I always reflect on what was what it was my experience with him. He was very, very respectful to me because he grew up in the fabulous one territory down there. So he watched us in our heyday. And, <clears throat> and he always talked to me about working out and just different things away from the business and everything. But I love the kid. But going back to Jerry Lawler, no matter what the heat was when I was a talent and the competition, and you'll never get over Lawler in Tennessee reputation and all of that kind of stuff or any of the confrontations we had my life changed at about 50 and then after that I saw stuff in a different light and I try to look at people and try to walk in their shoes for a little bit too and say wait a minute Steve you're not the judge now you're going to judge a guy you don't know anything about it and then when when Brian died it really put a whole different thing to me I walked right up to Jerry at an autograph thing and I think he thought I was probably on drugs because I said, Jerry, I just got, I just got, you know, my utmost sympathy for you and your condol the condolences. I, I loved your son to death and I'm so sorry for what happened and all of that. And, I mean, I started crying because that I really liked that kid. And, you know, Jerry's looking at me like my dog does when he's going, Ugh, this is weird. But <clears throat> I was so compassionate toward him. And I felt guilty for anything that I'd ever said or done. So, you know, it's like for whatever it was in my thirties, it didn't translate over. And so now I, I look at it differently that I don't laugh about it and want to call him up and say, Hey, you know, I grabbed it in your ground. Uh, you know, I'm gonna, I want to kind of go, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I did that. You know, I wasn't sorry then, but I'm sorry now, you know, and, just, uh, I don't want to have that kind of a feeling. I mean, you know, I look at my own grandchildren, like little Asher that was just kind of walking around here and I go, man, I, I want them to grow up and have a great life, but I don't try to tell my kids how to raise my grandkid. And the reason is, is because if you can't be somebody else's parents and you can't, you can give advice, but you can't tell them how to do it. That you got to walk 24 seven with them. You know, there's a whole kinds of things that have to be included. And, you know, kids are, you know, they're a great gift and everything, but they're also come with complications and stuff, too. So with those ones that have lost their sons, I mean, Ric Flair lost his son. Not a big fan of Ric Flair's. So I don't care if he hears it or whatever. Just I've never been really warm and fuzzy with him. I respect him and all of that. But when he lost his son, I felt so sorry for him. I mean, Mike Rotundo, um, Gerald and I were just at Wyndham's funeral. It's a heartbreaking, 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 especially like us. Me and Gerald watched Wyndham grow up since he was a little boy. We got Christmas cards here at our house that we used to take to FCW when him and Rotunda, I mean, when him and Taylor were talent there of them when they were little kids. We had one where they were in turtleneck sweaters one time when they were about, both about seven, eight years old, and they hated that picture, but known them all my life, and the same thing goes with anybody that, you know, has lost their child. I mean, you know, that, that's got to be the most devastating thing in the world. So 
I look at things a lot different. I autom- I automatically turn to compassion now instead of resentment about things. And like I said earlier, the wrestling business is your choice. It's your choice. It was my choice. The good part was great. The bad part wasn't so great, but it was still my choice. And so at the end of the day, I chose to do what I did, and I accepted all the consequences and responsibilities that came with it. And so for me to lash out in a book, me to lash out in a podcast, and you know, talk about somebody that somebody might not know something about somebody else, or you know, act like I didn't do something that they did. I mean, you know, it's insanity. But so, see, it's all about it's pop positive now. I, I I've read the the reviews of all your book that was on uh, Amazon. They were unbelievably, overwhelmingly positive. Has all the feedback you got for the book been so positive like that? Because I mean, it was just effusive how wonderful these remarks were in on Amazon. Well, it is. It, it, it most. I mean, you know, I only had one one negative feedback, and as I mentioned it earlier about me saying something about working with some older guys, and I don't know if it was. Bunk Harris's grandson that read the part that I wrote about Bunk Harris in there, you know, and I don't know, but um, everybody else has been very positive. But if if you look at the book, my foreword was done by CM Punk, or my afterward, I mean, my foreword was done by Stan Lane, and also by um, Nat- Natty Nyhart. Now, here's the thing. I could have asked people that I know for longer. I could have asked people that I know that would embellish whatever they wrote just to make me sound better than I am. But I tried to use people that I didn't know as long other than Stan. And the reason is, is because that they would give you an honest opinion when they're, when you're reading the book and you want to say, well, CM Punk even says, well, I wasn't even sure why Steve asked me to do it. But then when we discussed it, you know, he says he just wanted an honest opinion of who, I was when I met him. And I mean, you know, and so he wanted to write a thing about it. And Natty talked really nice. They were going to write kind words. But if I asked Brian Blair to do the forward to my book, or if I asked Gerald to do the forward to my book, they would go over and above to make me sound like something that maybe I am to them, but maybe I'm not to everybody else. So I wanted to get input from people that, you know, said, okay, well, I didn't really know Steve that long, but one thing I know about him was he was always nice to me. And and your real goal in life, it's not being the greatest worker. It's not being, you know, the greatest guy. It's being able to someday pass on and at your funeral, somebody that you touch their lives in the wrestling or any other way, come up to your family and say, you know, I'm going to miss your dad or I'm going to miss... I'm called Big Daddy as a grandpa. They're gonna, we're going to miss Big Daddy. You know, he was a good guy. That's really a goal. Your goal yeah. is everything else is meaningless. I'm a Bible reader. And if you're reading in Ecclesiastics, it's all about, you know, materialistic stuff being meaningless. There's no meaning to anything. It's all going to pass by. So what you leave, especially if you're going to write it down, don't damage people. I mean, you know, and yeah. tell the story. You know what I always say, and you guys might agree with this, and if you don't, don't matter. Opinion. That's a simple word, but that's what pro wrestling is. Pro wrestling, to me, is an opinion. Everybody has an opinion of what they watch on pro wrestling or what the business is about pro wrestling. Some are from experience being pro wrestlers. Some are for being fans. Some are for whatever. But it's all an opinion. It's each individual's opinion. You can find somebody that watched New York wrestling and Bruno San Martino was the greatest guy in the world. And then you can find somebody that watched Florida wrestling and Jack and Jerry Briscoe were the greatest wrestling tag team in the world. But the thing about it is, it's that their opinion from what they watch, what they witnessed, what their experiences were. I guarantee you that the three of us think pretty much on the same level but we could sit down and we could find differences of opinions of what we like and what we don't like. If we watched the match and we said, okay, write down what you liked and what you didn't like. I guarantee you that our three things would be a little bit varied in opinions. It's because it's our opinion. It's the right. opinion you have from being a worker. It's opinion Gerald has from being a worker agent. 
the parent and I have from being a worker, an agent, and a teacher and seeing what talent goes through and learning. So we're going to have a difference of opinion. You're going to come back with yours. Well, I, you know, I didn't like this. They didn't sell their moves. They got the guy worked his arm the whole time. And the guy acted like it wasn't even nothing wrong with it at the end of the match or, or I'm going to say too many two counts. You shouldn't be using a two count until you're in a desperate situation or time has gone by in a match. It's, it's about one, two, three. You got one or two. We used to kick out before the referee even got there a lot of times in the past days. But it could be I didn't like their appearance. I didn't like what they had on. I didn't like their body. I mean, you know, so we're all going to have differences of opinion. But pro wrestling, to me, it's an opinion. And, and whatever it is, nobody's right, nobody's wrong. Because it's simply an opinion. Steve, and, Steve, Steve. Yeah. Now that you guys have unmuted me, I have a question. Uh -oh. I've been saying up until you guys have had me muted this whole damn interview. It has been a pretty damn good interview. I want to get in on this conversation here. What happened to the gator behind you? Is that a blow-up gator? Is that a pull gator? Or was that a real gator? He answered my call. That's yeah, yeah. Real... Give, us, give us a gator call. Watch. Well, he might come off of the wall. Oh, wow. <laughs> can, you, can you see him? Yep. This, is, this is the belly cut. You only mount the belly cut <clears throat> when you're going to have the skin tanned. That's from the lower jaw cutting all the way around, all the way down to the tail. So the skull's not attached to this. This is off of a 10 and a half foot alligator. I killed 15 in the first harvest. I got one here. I got one in my son's room upstairs. But what it what it is is I only kept a few things. And this is a good story. I'll lead you into another one. Skinner, this was the only thing I had when I went to see Vince when, that, when I was trying to get the job as Skinner, but I didn't know it was going to be Skinner. I walked into the office and everybody was a character, so I laid down an alligator's hide like that. I laid a skull, I laid paws, I laid teeth, and Vince goes, what's that? And I said, well, everybody up here is a character. I've been Steve Kern all my life, whether it's fabulous ones or whatever. I said, but it's been Steve Kern. And he goes, yeah. And I said, well, I killed 15 alligators. Maybe you could do something. Go home. You're hired. Go home for a month. We'll figure it out. We'll call you. Next trip up. Hey, Steve, we got it. What is it? Did you see the movie Deliverance? <laughs> and I go, yeah, about a hundred times. Now here's Steve to enlighten you. I'd already gone through the part of my career as a young guy that I was never going to brown nose anybody or suck up to any promoter, right? Then I got around Kevin Sullivan. And in the Carolinas, I tell Kevin Sullivan while we're smoking pot, I tell Kevin Sullivan, you know what? I never liked you when you were in Florida. You're such a suck ass. Your head was so far up Mike Graham's ass. It's the first time he'd ever been six feet in his life. Kevin says to me, Stevie, he calls me Stevie. He's the only one that calls me Stevie. He says, Stevie, nobody feeds my family but me. I'm feeding my family. So you need to learn that if you're going to take care of you, nobody else is going to take care of you. And then he taught me that if you say nice things to people, you might get used <laughs> instead, <laughs> instead of trying to figure it out on your own. And so why I was saying that about the Skinner thing was when Vince is talking to me, now I'm to the suck ass age. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, Vince. I saw Deliverance 10 times. I'm excited, yeah, what? Oh, well, we want you to be one of those guys, Steve. Oh, okay. Well, Vince, I was just one of the fabulous ones. I guess you want me to be Burt Reynolds, right? I could get a vest. I could get a bow and arrow, whatever he used. I know I saw it 10 times. You know, anyway, no, we don't want you to be that guy. We want you to be one of the two guys in the woods with Ned Beatty and say, hey, boy, you got a right pretty mouth. <laughs> I said, I said well, at least you didn't want me to play the banjo. <laughs> 
anyway. So that's the alligator thing. But that was a lot of fun. That was alligators were on an endangered species list for 26 years in Florida, and then they took it off and they had it called it a harvest. Well, with the harvest, you had to send in um on a lottery system application for the Fish and Freshwater Games Commission in the state of Florida, your entry blank. But you could send in as many as you wanted and you know, other name. So I went around everywhere in the wrestling in the dressing rooms, the office. I got Dusty to fill one out, Gordon Soley to fill one out. My mom filled one out. My dad filled one out. Anybody I know, fill one out. Guess who gets drawn? Gordon Soley gets drawn. <laughs> and here comes Gordon Soley. Hey, you owe me $280. I got drawn for that alligator harvest. And you're the co-hunter on my license. And I'm going, man, of all people they could have picked, it's Gordon. So anyway, Gordon and I were on the on the hunting license and I got 15 tags. <laughs> this is what happens when you when you're five. <laughs> you see something up there? He tells me when when he was in a swimming pool, he gets up really close on me. He says, you know, big daddy, you're getting old. <laughs> or, hey, what's that in your ear? What is that? What is that? Or you got something coming out of your nose. This kid smartens me up to everything. <laughs> Wouldn't trade it for a million dollars. But anyway, the, the alligator thing and, and doing a Skinner thing, that was it. I got all these hides. I kept a lot of them. I've got a bunch of skulls upstairs in one room. I've got teeth and these things called scoots, which is what, if you look at an alligator on their back, those bumps that are on their back, those are called scoots. I have a whole bunch of those. They're actually like a brick. It's a bone that heats up. And when they lay on the bank, then they go under and, and hibernate in the winter and keep their body warm. So I just got into alligators. But the alligators, you, know, you guys are going to get bored and cut me off and I'll just be talking to myself, but alligators came because that I got too carried away with sharks. I was glad I didn't get try to get the job with Vince earlier because <laughs> I was in... You had to have been Jaws. Yeah, I was, in, I was in the sharks. When that movie Jaws came out, I freaked out. I bought Duke Kiyomoko's boat. I went over <laughs> to his house. I bought his boat. It was a fishing boat. I shark fished every day. I was catching sharks at the Skyway Bridge long enough to be like, you know, the boat. And and then it wasn't exciting anymore. So me and Mike start going underwater, chumming them up and hitting them with bang sticks. That right there above the, the shark, below the shark. Let's see if I can see it. That rail that runs across there. Can you see that pole? Yeah. At the very bottom. Yeah. That's a bang stick. That's what I killed them with. What is so that we, circle at the bottom of the gator? What's the what? That circle at the bottom of the gator there. That's where they go to the bathroom. No, no, they're, they're that big white. Uh, you see the circle, John? You mean on top of the alligator? Oh, in the middle of the alligator. Yeah, yeah. That's a window, I think. No, that's mm -hmm. a that's a that's a that's a cutout arch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm talking about right there, right there, right there. Big daddy. What? You said I killed the shark with nails. You see it? Yeah. Let me hold it up there and I'll point. Oh. Are you talking about right there? No. Middle. Middle. I can't see you now, Steve. <laughs> right there. That. There's no there's nothing up there, Gerald. Please use the way it's uh, put on there, Jerry. Right there. Huh? It's a it's a reflection. Okay. It's a reflection of the lights here. Okay. Yeah, I got skylights in this room here. Okay. So it's a reflection from down on the sun. Okay. Well, that's a big ordeal. Well, Steve, <laughs> I, I, I thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate you taking the time and Mr. Briscoe being muted made the show a lot better. And yeah. <laughs> but, but congratulations. Hey, Asher. How you doing, Asher? He you can't hear you. Me. Wait a minute. Hold it. Hi, now Asher. I can hear you. Hi. Say hi. How you doing? How was school today? Wait a minute. Uh, How was school today, Asher? Yes. Hard? Did you hear him? Yeah. No. How was school? Good. 
What did he say, Steve? He said it was good. Good. All right, good. Thank you. Thank you for uh, translating that. Of course. I'm good with that. Hey, Steve, uh, yeah. hey, Steve, thank you so much. Good luck on the book. Can't wait for the second part. And, uh, <laughs> well, appreciate you being the only person well, to come on Briscoe and Bradshaw for the second time. Hey, has anybody ever come on with a five-year-old? Never. No, never. Well, now nah, it's the second time. This is the first time for that then. First time That's for right. a five-year-old. Second Absolutely. time. All right. Well, this is Steve Kern, Skinner, Doink, Fabulous One, Black Angel. Whatever. Black Angel. Yeah, I was a black angel. I don't remember I don't remember that one. Right there, buddy. You see that? Yes. Did you live yeah. with uh, uh, Dick Slater? Is that or did you date No, nah, I, I was in Guatemala. They sent me to Guatemala for five weeks when I first started to see if I'd survive. Huh. I did. They didn't speak you any did. English. Yeah, they did. They spent, sent me down there. That's in the book. I went down there. They gave me a mask to wear. I only wore a mask one time, and that was in the, um, Guatemala. And I was there five weeks. Nobody spoke any English. I got my cab turned over. My windows kicked out. I mean, you know, I almost died in Guatemala. Get that finger down. <laughs> He's I didn't know how that. To, I, yeah. That's how my, I yeah. need to read the book. You got to read sure the book. Do. You sure do, because Kevin Sullivan read it. He said, you know, I went to Guatemala. <laughs> Kevin had gone to Guatemala too. I've been to Guatemala. I mean, did you stay five weeks? I, I went, I went, no, I did. I stayed five hours, about seven hours, actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, they did. They sent me there with a one way ticket when I was 19 years old. <laughs> <laughs> you both you got back. Um, I heard I did. Well, you heard you did. All right. Yeah. We're, we're well, thank you guys. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you.